Okay, we're up. Carson Foster, welcome to the podcast, man. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I've, I've, I've been super looking forward to this. Well, I've, I've been looking forward to it, man. Um, you know, we we have spoken before on, on the show, which has been cool. And uh, I think it was over the Olympics, right? Or didn't you come on during the Olympics? It was, yep. I was home in Cincinnati watching. Yeah, that was wild, man. And But, um, you know, but the, the reality of the situation is maybe you should have been there, you know? And I think that was kind of like a... Uh, all of us, any anytime we miss out on something, it's like, you know, it's, it kind of feeds a fuel and fire, you know, and and certainly this past kind of like since the Olympics, what's it been now about uh, 10 months or so? I mean, you've been just on fire and, uh, you know, what, what did it mean to you to, to miss the Olympics and have to sit there and watch it? Yeah, I think honestly, it was probably the greatest life lesson, swimming lesson um, that I've ever had I think I went into it with a mindset of like I'm gonna make the Olympic team or it's a failure um which put a lot of pressure on me it had a lot of drawbacks um once I was gone from trials I was kind of in a funk for like two weeks I like unfollowed USA Swimming on Instagram because I couldn't take seeing all like the pictures of everyone at training camp or Mm. um how everyone was making the team and having fun in Hawaii or going to the uh the Olympics, like I was just having a really hard time with that. And knowing that I was capable of going a time that would have made it, I think, and honestly, all three of my events last year, I felt like I could have gone a time that would have made it. Um, I just fell short a little bit on each one. And um, I think leaving, I, I didn't want to swim the rest of the summer. I wanted to take the rest of the summer off. And then, um, so when I got back down to Austin about a week and a half after trials, Every, all my friends were at practice, so I was like, ah, I might as well go to practice and hang out with them and talk to Eddie and Wyatt. And I ended up getting in, but I was kind of just going in the back of the lane. But um, you've been to our practices. You know how it is. Like, once you get into a, a groove of a practice, like, you can't help but race people. And so, mm-hmm. like, I got back into it, and I just started racing people again. And um, that's what swimming's fun to me. I mean, swimming is awesome when you're winning and when you're, like, getting – uh, recognized and when you're making teams, but like swimming is its most fun to me when I just get to race. That's why I love practice so much. Like I, I genuinely enjoy going to practice, especially here, just because it's like, it's a race every day and you're racing someone new and I'm so competitive that that like fills my competitive side. Um, well, that's definitely like, something I've heard about you, you know, like, and seen it firsthand in terms of the, the standard that you set of practice. And it's, it's unusual for a young man to come in and have that kind of an impact on such a world-renowned program so immediately. And, and you and your brother um, have both done that, which has been incredible. I didn't realize to the extent that this really hurt you. Obviously, you're a competitor and obviously you wanted to be at the Olympics, but it sounded like it hit you really hard then. It definitely did. Um, but then I kind of learned, like, one, like, I'm young. I think that was hard for me to realize. Like, I didn't see myself as, like, a 19-year-old who was trying to make his first Olympic team. I saw it as, like, all right, this could be my last chance. What if something happens to me mm-hmm. over the next few years and I don't make it again? Yep. Um, so that's kind of what I went into it with. And when I didn't make it, it definitely hit hard. And um, I don't want to say I felt like I let, let anyone down because I always – I do it for myself. And um, I know everyone in my corner loves me no matter what. But, like, I wanted to do it for the city of Mason, my club team. I wanted to do it. Uh, for myself, for my club coach, um, just because I wanted to be Mason's first Olympian. Um, so I, I did, I was not disappointed in myself, but I, I wanted that for, for not only me, but for them. Um, so that what about this? Did you, did you watch those races live at the Olympics? The ones that you should have been in, you felt like? I watched the, so the 4am happened the day after I went 408. So I was a little bit more intrigued because I was like, wow, I don't think my time's going to win, but I think it, it's going to medal at least. So I wanted to watch it. Mm. Um, so I did watch that. Uh, Townley was in the 200 free and I trained with Townley. So I watched that one. And then the 200 I am actually was on your show to watch. So right. I watched all three. Um, Sorry, I, mean, I forced you to watch that two I am with us. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. None of my times would have done anything from trials. Um, yeah. So like there is that part of it, but um, yeah, I, I did watch those and it was definitely hard to watch the Olympics. I, 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 can't say I enjoyed it too much just because I was always wanting to be there, but. What about posting a time then that would have won the gold medal, you know, just within, within 
you know, like you said, kind of 24 hours type thing, you know, like, um, how, how did that feel? It was awesome. So like, at first it was kind of like a mixed emotion. Like I was like, oh, like it was, it kind of just brought me back to it. Cause I had been in a really good spot of like accepting that I wasn't there and just being excited to race at sectionals and just show my best. And then I went, then I went that time and it would have won. And so it kind of brought me back down. Like, oh, like I should have made it. Like I could have, could have maybe won the Olympics, but then like, I took, I took a step back and was like, this is the coolest thing I've done in the sport to this point. Like I've never made a senior na international trip. I've never won any type of like big medal, like be finishing the year with the fastest time in the world is the coolest thing I've done to this point. So I need to sit back and appreciate that because it's, it's going to be part of my journey. Um, and so like that was last summer's, uh, like accomplishment for me. So at the end of the day, I was really happy with it. I think I may have asked you this earlier, but just kind of maybe just to touch on it again, since that we're in this point right now, is there anything you could have done differently at trials in your, in your mind, like physically, mentally, uh, emotionally, do you look back and say, I wish I had have done that instead of that? Um, I think obviously besides like the race strategy, um, in the 400 I am, I think I kind of botched that a little bit just cause I was not scared, but excited. Um, so I, obviously I could have probably had a better race strategy, but I think moving past the 4am, I think I had a great shot at making the two free. I honestly thought I was going to get top three. Um, just the way I was training and racing. I thought that there was only the only two people that could beat me were, I thought in my mind, Drew and Kieran. Um, and so I was, I was fully expecting to get top six. And I think after the 400 I am, uh, I just mentally was in a spot where I was like, well, that was my best shot. So. Like, let me ask you. The, let me ask you this in terms of mentality, because I think this is interesting, and and, and maybe there's some lessons here for all of us. When you say, when you say, I felt like there are only two people that could beat me. Why did? You, why do you think those two people in particular could beat you? I think because, and I, this is something that I've kind of changed because is it that mindset was very different from the mindset I had last week. But that was right. just kind of me okay. last year. I mean, I train with Drew, um, mm -hmm. and Drew, Drew's been a great leader in our group for me and I've done like gotten to race him every day so like I know what I knew what he was going to be able to throw down and just Karen was on fire so me thinking that all I have to do is get get third behind those two and then I still make it um that's definitely somewhere where I've kind of grown but yeah that's definitely the mindset I kind of had how do we overcome a, a mindset like that or how do we tackle it or even how do we confront it you know like when you know you know, realistically, maybe in your own mind, there's someone that is better than you. Maybe you see them every day, right? Like a Drew, you know, like a, and, and, and you just see what they can produce, but you, you also know that you have to race them. And you also know that there's only one spot, let's say, and it's you or you or them, you know, like, how do you overcome something like that? Is it possible to beat somebody that you think may even be better than you? Absolutely. I think, I don't think, I mean, I think I am now, I, I confidently think I am now, but I don't think I was the best four ammer in the world last year. Um, I think I put together a perfect race and that's what it takes every time. I mean, I'm at, you're, we're all at a level now where if you put together a perfect race, you're probably going to beat everyone else if they don't. Um, I think we're at, we're at such a high level now. So that's kind of the strategy I, or the mindset I go into it with. If I swim perfect, it's, I'm going to be really hard to beat. Um, and I think if I would have had a perfect race last summer in the two free, so I'm at right and knew my strategy going in and executed it, I think I could have very well been up there with them. Um, what about this? Then? I'm going to throw this at you in terms of like, I'm going to test you here. So what if your race isn't perfect and their race isn't perfect? And then all of a sudden you kind of in the same position in the pool. What does it come down to then? I mean, at that point, I feel like it's, it's somewhat, I mean, if you got someone who's probably a little bit more talented you in the event or a little bit more experienced and you guys are both swimming, like not perfect, I think it's probably goes to the person who is, has more experience in the event or is a better freestyler. I think, I think that for me last summer and where I was and my development in freestyle, especially, um, I think I, I, I was going to have to have one, a perfect race to win, but then like you said, it wasn't perfect, but I think I still could have made it. I think it was a lot of mental going into the, I was in last the entire race. And so like flipping onto the last 50, I was like, oh my goodness, not again. I'm going to get, I'm going to miss it by just a little bit again. So I think last year was a lot of mental, uh, 
I was holding my back, holding me, myself back mentally. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think that's where what you said, like, that's where I could have been better is I was like, yeah, after the first day, I was so mentally out of the meat. When you say you feel like you're the best 400 I am in the world now, what what gives you that belief? Is it is it you feel like you're more of a complete package now? You're from fly back breast to free, like you feel pretty solid in all the all the strokes and how you're putting them together. You feel like you're I don't know, your aerobic capacity, your VO2 capacity. I mean, what what is it that gives you the, the confidence now to make you feel like you are genuinely the best in the world? I think I spent a lot of my career growing up swimming it as sprinting the fly in the back just to get a big lead. And mm -hmm. just because I knew I could win, I was at a level where like, I knew I could win if I get far enough ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and I was a very much like an age group mindset. And I think I've changed that a little bit. I might, obviously since college, I, I Eddie and Wyatt give me a ton of aerobics. So my aerobic capacity is way higher now mm -hmm. than it was mm -hmm. when I was in high school or even last year. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, my freestyle splits have gotten better consistent, consistently. Um, I don't feel like I have a super strong or a super like weak, weak stroke. I think breaststroke is definitely my weak stroke, but I don't think it's a horrible week. I think I had like the third mm -hmm. fastest split in the field last week behind Chase and Jake. So I don't think it's su super big weak stroke. Um, I also just, I say that based on the way I train. I see that I, I have had really good training sets where I finish and I'm like, all right, like, I don't know if this is me speaking. I don't know if anyone else in the world could have done that. And that's how I kind of get my confidence is I do those training sets and, um, I get really jacked up. Can you up give me an it. example of that? Like, I, I really like that train of thought, you know, where you've touched the wall and like, that's a set. I don't think anyone could do that. Or I just killed that thing. Like, is there something that comes into your mind where you, where you have a memory of a set like that, that you could share with us? I think in the fall, there was one where I did, I did three rounds of a 500 on five minutes and then a 400 on five minutes and three rounds of that. Um, so it's essentially like a 900 where you go 500 free, 400 IM, you just get a small break. And I was mm -hmm. the 500s, I was 450, 448, 444. And mm -hmm. then I went on the four IMs, I was 358, 355, 353. Mm -hmm. wow. Um, and so I felt like, and then there was a couple of times I did so much 4am stuff this fall, uh, short course. What did you say the rest point, cycle was for that? Sorry. Uh, five minutes on the 500 and mm -hmm. then five minutes on the 4am. Wow. So, so not, not about, tons of rest, but you're going, no, you're going like for it. 15 seconds on the, after the 500 and then about a minute after right. the 4am. Did you have um, other people doing that with you or were you doing that alone? I did it with Will Lacone. Jake had to practice earlier in the day, so I didn't get to do it with Jake, but Will Lacone always jumps in those 4am sets with me. Okay, Will, good for you, man. Did you beat up on yeah. him a little bit? Uh, he, he had just gotten back from ISL, so mm. he, he was still getting back into it, but uh, he Will Will hangs tough in those 4am sets. So there's never a, an IM set where Jake and I can really just beat up on Will because he's he's tough. He'll never, he'll never give up in practice. Good for him, man. He's a good, he's a good guy. I like Will, too. We individualize training in the pool, so why not individualize your nutrition? Erica Barney of Barney Wellness Building will help you and your swimmers get exactly what each athlete needs through genetic testing and personalized nutrition plans. So stop guessing what you should and shouldn't be putting into your body. Athletes within a few weeks have noticed they're recovering faster because they're fueling their body with what they need and staying away from what their body hates. Erica understands swimming. She gets it. She's worked with over 20 Olympians, including the fastest man in the world, Caleb Dressel. Group discounts are available. So go to Biney Wellness Building and get in touch with Erica today. That's Biney, B-E-I-N-E, wellnessbuilding.net. Was there another set you're, you're going to talk about? Uh, there was a broken set I did. I remember this was before trial. So this was when Wyatt first told me that for the first time it was like i did a set where it was a 50 fly um 100 fly 50 fly and then 50 back 100 back 50 back 50 breasts 100 bre 100 breasts 50 breasts 50 free 100 free 50 free it's basically a broken 800 im uh short rest that was suited up it was long course i don't exactly remember my times but i remember i finished it and i was holding well under 4 im pace the entire way um so i was i was I was hauling that day and I remember I got out and I was pretty pumped about it, but I didn't really know what it meant because it was 800 I am. Um, and why it just told me like, I don't think there was anyone else in the world that could have gone that fast in that today. 
Um, and so that was the first time I was like, whoa, like that was the first time I thought of myself as like a high level, like in the world for I am her. Um, and so that's kind of what stemmed it. Am I missing something like here, man? Because you're a nice guy, right? And I know a lot of 400 I amers in history and, and they're, they're nice guys, but they got a little mean in them too. You got to have some mean, right? If you want to be a four I amer, there's got to be something <laughs> in there. Like, is there something tucked away in you? There's a little mean in there. I, I, I'm just, I'm probably the most competitive person you'll ever meet. I think, really? I think you'll know if you talk to the group, I mean, Kobe and Drew kind of mess with me sometimes because they know that if, if so, if I'm winning a set and then even if it's warm up and then someone will come in on the last one and beat me, I'll, I'll kind of light you up for it. Um, <laughs> if you, if you do some uh, Sally save up stuff, that's what my, my biggest trigger is. But, and I, I, from warm up on, it's like my, my thing mentally is like I want to win every single thing in practice so like I'm, I'm winning warm-up most days unless someone wants to race me then it'll turn into a race um and it's just so that's my competitive side I won't really I'm not really I, I wouldn't say I'm a mean guy um <laughs> I think mentally I have like I get fired up sometimes mm, um right and it'll only come up sometimes in practice but yeah, listen, I, I I talked to Clark Smith about this, and, and he said that he got into a little bit of trouble with this mentality too, where it, it almost became um, part of his daily routine where he couldn't let anyone beat him. It was almost, um, we, we kind of talked about it in a way of kind of like, uh, you know, like an eating disorder where, where it controls you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it becomes, it starts off as a good thing kind of thing. You know, you're watching your calories type of thing, and, and then all of a sudden, food controls you now it's like yeah you want to win everything but all of a sudden it becomes ridiculous where you know it's just impossible to win everything all the time and and it shouldn't happen like that is it, do you fear that it might start to like really overtake you and then drive you into this kind of mentality or position where you're just dealing with some sort of like chronic fatigue or something because you just can't keep up with it all the time is that does that worry you it doesn't only because like you said like it's impossible to win every day i don't win every day and okay. you look at my if you look at my training group i think we have the best training group in the world so it is impossible to win every day mm -hmm. um and i quickly learned that there there were some days at the beginning where i was like all right because it was kind of like the start of the season where i was like all right i'm gonna try and win every set i do um and there were i quickly realized it's impossible mm -hmm. um at, at just in the training group we have so no, I don't. I mean, it doesn't ruin my day if I don't win. Um, mm. It's just like, it's kind of like a checkbox. Like I kind of like go into practice. All right, win this set, move on to the next one. Win this set, move on to the next one. It's kind of like kick. Like I'll never win a kick set because I'm not that good at kick. Mm, okay. um, and so, like, but I'm going to try my hardest and make my legs cramp until I can at least push the person who is winning. Um, now, listen, you do have Eddie Reese, who's one of the uh, greatest coaches of all time, if not the greatest. Um, and I would have i would think he knows what gets under your skin so do you think there's been times where eddie may have gone up to another guy on the on the team and whispered in their ear hey just um just save up here for a second and then stick it to carson on the last round or something like that just to kind of <laughs> eddie's eddie's way of getting under my skin is coming up to me and telling me that someone's gonna beat me um <laughs> and he more just does it with like relays like i remember me and eddie had a had a bet at the invite meet where I was only swimming a relay and then 4 a.m. So I wasn't swimming much, but I was on the A relay and Eddie told me that three out of the four people on the B relay were going to beat me. And oh, wow. I remember like <laughs> taking a step back and being like, then why am I on the A relay? Mm -hmm. um, and it just like, it fired me up. And um, he said that if, if it didn't happen, if I, if I had the fastest split out of anyone that I would get, uh, he would buy me a Chick-fil-A milkshake. And I mean, Luke, then Luke Hobson, our freshman, who we didn't know was going to pop a 131, split a 131-1 on the B relay. So I didn't, I didn't win the bet, but um, it got me fired up. I split my, at the time, it was my fastest split ever. Um, and then also, there's another story, like Eddie fired me up, and I think he did this on purpose, but this one really fired me up. I came back from Shore Force Worlds, which I thought was like one of my best meets ever at the time. Um, and Eddie's first thing he said to me was, you're too fast to be swimming that slow. <laughs> and I was like, what? And so like that fired me up. And I remember being all upset and talking to Wyatt about it and Wyatt was like, he's just trying to push you. Like he's, he wants you to be better. Um, so I took that and I was like, all right, I gotta be better. Um, it was a good meet, but not, not my end goal. And so I think, I think Eddie definitely has his ways of motivating me. Listen, man, Eddie doesn't say anything that doesn't, isn't calculated to some respect. Yeah. You know? <laughs> he's, a, he's a smart man. He's been doing this a while, so he, he knows, but, um, uh -huh. 
you're starting to dabble now into these kind of sexier events like the 200 freestyle let's say you're starting to have some success there the, the 400 im is a grueling event and and you know not only just racing it but the training of it and it takes its toll on people do you do you have a, a timetable in your mind of how long you want to swim this event you know now that you're starting to have success in some of these shorter events does that does that worry you that you might feel like oh, I, don't, I don't want to do the work for the 4am anymore that I'm, I'm happier in this two free kind of situation uh i think eventually as i get older maybe i'll get to that point i i my the 4am is my favorite event i right. i enjoy training for the 4am the most i enjoy swimming the 4am the most mm -hmm. um i think i want to do the 4am i mean god willing until i like stop winning it or stop competing at a high level um and if that means i swim it all the way until 2032 hopefully then i'll do it i mean i love training for it i don't know if my body will allow it but i'm thankful that i'm developing these other events as like a backup um and something to go along with it but no my plan is definitely to stick with the forum the forum is my favorite event all right a lot of people talk about this world record then in this 4am um where is it breakable for you like what, what where do you improve how do you get down to it first of all um where do you where are you going to make your improvements in your splits let's say so i think i think phelps and i have very similar like strengths and weaknesses i think backstroke i flipped the fly in the back for our i think phelps's best stroke was i i think it's probably freestyle um just with how he split the race and what his 200s were but um so i think that's both of our best strokes and then i think backstrokes my second best flies my third his is the opposite but very similar and breast is our weak stroke so i mean when you i've watched that race probably like 50 times and his 54 9 that he did in the first 100 i mean it was easy and so i think getting down for me at least to like a 55 low we're making it super easy and then i think our backstroke splits are going to be pretty similar uh when i'm at my peak i think i think my backstroke is a very big strength of mine and i'm getting better at it and getting stronger and learning to swim it without kicking a bunch um i think breaststroke is probably if i'm going to be anywhere close to what he was i think my breaststroke has to be better than his than his was um i think he was like a 110 mid uh and I, I, my best is like a 111.0. So I have a little bit more to go in that, in that stroke. And then freestyle was a 56, like five. So, I mean, that's the one where it's like, if I'm going to, if, if someone's ever going to break that record, they're going to have to be having the swim of their life because they're going to have to come home and sub 57, which is, I mean, not many people do. I mean, Bobby just did it. Uh, I think Brendan Smith did it uh, for Australia last summer. I think Jay has done it like once or twice. So like not many people have done it and the guys who have done it, like that's their thing. That's, that's what they do in the event. Um, and Phelps swam it. He had the fastest first 300 in history and then also had the fastest last 100. So mm, it's a crazy yeah. record, but I definitely think I, everything's going to have to happen on the back half for me if I want to get down to that. Yeah. It's a nasty record. There's actually been some debate recently in terms of which record people think will go first. Will it be the 200 free from Biederman or the 400 I am from Phelps? I think the four I am. Mm -hmm. I think, I think there's definitely way more, there's way more room to improve for a four I am -er who's at a 408, 409 right now, or 407. If there's anyone, or actually Diacetto is at four six, but there's way more room to improve from in a 4 am with your switching strokes than a 200 free where it's essentially just a dead sprint especially at that point if you're going 142 you gotta be i mean that you're probably out in, at this in this day and age probably 49 mid 49, and then coming back yeah. super mm -hmm. fast so yeah i mean that's just a dead sprint at that point and i think mm -hmm. both records are insane i don't want to make it sound like i think the 4 am <laughs> records some like slouch but yeah i think it, those are the top two records in history but i think definitely the two free yeah they're, they're both nasty but um have you had a chance to talk to phelps personally i've not nope never no I've, I've i've gotten kind of closer with chase this year uh, okay. which has been really cool um and i know he learned a lot of what he knows now from phelps so i've kind of getting secondhand information from phelps but no I've, I've never gotten to meet him personally all right a lot of people watch this podcast and people who know how to connect people can can do these things let's get someone to connect phelps with carson all right let's get these two talking i want them to figure out you know, I'm, I'm sure Phelps would want an American, if anybody, to break his world record or at least have a crack at it or get closer to it. I'm sure he would be glad to share information and
kind of talk you through that. So let's get someone connected here. Come on, help us out. Um, we can do this. But, uh, that would be that would be pretty sweet. Yeah, oh, absolutely, man. I'm sure he would. It's like my know? first my first role model in the sport. Obviously, it was like the first swim meet I ever watched was 2008. Really? Okay. So what kind of impact did that have on you? I think uh, my parents made us watch it because we were swimmers at the time. But like, I didn't <laughs> I didn't really care about swimming. I was more in it. Like, I like baseball, basketball. So like. I remember my parents kind of understanding like the significance of it and how cool it was and how like once in a lifetime it was going to be. And so I remember they sat us all down and we all watched swimming at night um, because it was always on prime time for us since it was in Beijing. Um, And so I remember we watched every night and I didn't realize that he was winning every event. I just assumed like that's what the best swimmer does. Like you just win every event you swim. Um, But yeah, that's kind of when I was like, all right, I'll go to practice. I'll work really hard. (laughs) <laughs> um, just like that eight-year-old mindset or however old I was, I think I might've been seven, but. I was actually scrolling through my phone the other day and I distinctly remember the photo reminded me, but I distinctly remember standing on the pool deck right at the turn end of the 400 IM and Phelps was in lane eight or one, I think for the final, I can't remember. I think it was lane eight, but lane eight was closest to me. And I remember taking a photo of Phelps right as he hit the wall. Um, and unfortunately, and I'm a terrible photographer. Uh, and so his head was down completely underwater. And, and you can see his hands touching the water. But then in my memory, I know exactly who it is, but you can't tell who it is. So I didn't post it. I could, it could have been anyone, but it was Phelps in the Olympic final of the 400 IM. And I'm literally like three feet away from him. I felt like I could have jumped on him. At that point. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was very, very fortunate to be on the deck watching that man swim many races. Um, in terms of his competitiveness, is there something you can learn from him or take away from him? So that's something actually Chase has talked to me a little bit about, just like the mindset you have to have in a 4 IM. It's like the most painful event. So like you don't want to go in, like you have to have, be prepared for that. Um, and you have to train knowing that it's going to hurt and you have to make yourself hurt like that in practice. So I think that's something I can kind of learn. I think I'm never going to be any less competitive than I am now. I think even when I'm done swimming, I'm going to find something else to be competitive about. So um, I'm very much someone who like, once I set a goal until I complete that goal, I'm going to be like all in for it. Um, And it, it irks me to lose. And any of my teammates will tell you that. Like if I, if I, if I lose a race that I really want to win, like, I, I just it makes me mad for like 20 minutes and then I get over it but I'm 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 pretty upset but so I don't think there's anything I can learn more about being competitive um but I think there's so much more I can learn about mental preparation um how he attacked every practice how he how he was able to be better every practice and recover in between sessions and races and practices so um there's so much more I want to learn and I'm a swim nerd so uh there's definitely a lot I could learn from him why would the why would the current Olympic champion be helping the the new up and coming guy, especially someone that's posted a time that's just as good as him? Like, why is why is Chase helping you out? Honestly, at, the, at first, I, I I honestly thought the same thing. I was like, I wonder why I wonder why he's helping me out so much. And I think it's it's honestly, and when I talked to him, he was like, I mean, I had he was like, I had the greatest mentor when I was thirteen years old up until now. Like, I was able to ask Phelps whatever I wanted, and he helped me get to where I was, and so. He, want, he chased him. He wanted to continue that legacy in the 4 a.m. Mm-hmm. for the U.S. And he wants to be there for the next guy. So he's he's taken a responsibility for himself to, like, help the next 4 a.m. or in his eyes, which I'm super honored and grateful that he sees that in me. Um, and he's, he's willing to help me because he wants to keep that uh, Olympic gold medal within the country. Um and that so, yeah, awesome. super, yeah, that's super it shows cool. it shows a lot about chase it shows it, does, it really does about. because he's doing it behind the scenes too he's not doing it out in public it's just um it, it's really cool that he's doing that hey uh-huh yeah definitely uh, he has talked to me about dropping the 400 i am i didn't even think he was going to swim it at this trials because we had had conversations that he wasn't going to do it but then he did it, it um it, did it surprise you that he did it and then second of all is he do you think he'll swim it at world championships he told me before the meet that he was going to do it because um, we had been talking and I don't think he wanted to like give off the impression he wasn't doing it and then just decided to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I knew he was going to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think I think he will do it and at, uh, at uh at worlds i think he hasn't i don't think from what he's told me he's he's kind of shifted his training focus to 200 im so i think mm-hmm. yeah i mean he went 410 without really even training for it so i th- i think he should do it because i think he could get i mean with based on that swim he's gonna be faster than he was last year last summer yeah. um and yeah. uh so i definitely think he will do it i haven't asked him if he is but i'm assuming he is um but yeah, I, think, I, think. I just had another training question, actually. I was thinking about this. There's kind of different theories on how to best coach an IAMA. Um, some say to coach the, the stroke so you get better in the two-fly, two-back, two-breast, two-free type training and not do a lot of straight IAM. And then there's the, the theory of kind of like the, you know, the, the freestyle mix with the IAM. So like you said, the 500, free, 400, I am, you know, flip-flopping kind of those sets where you do straight IMs. And then there's the theory of kind of like some shorter racing IMs. So it's like, what do you, what do you think about training the IM? How do you feel more comfortable? Um, I feel most, I, the way Eddie and Wyatt have done it for me, I think I grew up in a club program with Ken Heiss and Mason, where I think I was training more of the shorter I am. Like he talked about, like I trained each stroke and trained pace. I did a lot mm-hmm. of 4 IM pace. And then once I got to Texas, it's definitely been way more of, uh, like I said earlier, like the aerobic freestyle mixed in with IM. Mm-hmm. And then Eddie has, Eddie and Wyatt have a system where if you're an IMer, every morning practice you do is totally weak stroke. So every single morning practice I've done since I've been at Texas has been totally breaststroke focused. Mm. Um, and so that's where I get my weak stroke in. Uh, and then afternoon, I'm either doing aerobic free, aerobic IM, or like backstroke pace or back mm. aerobic backstroke. I do a lot of backstroke. I don't really ever train fly. I think that's more of just like a strength thing. And I, I touch it when I do I am, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly doing aerobic free or aerobic I am. Wow. When you're training your breaststroke, you say every morning, what, what type of work are you doing for that? Uh, Eddie's very big into uh, breaststroke pull with fins on. So you do, it's just a work on tempo. And that's my weakness in breaststroke is that I have a really slow tempo and I have a lot of trouble getting my tempo up. Um, and that's something that helps me, uh, work, put fins on, do dolphin kick with a breaststroke pull. Um, I'm doing a ton of that. Uh, I've also done a ton of breaststroke kick working on my flexibility, like getting, getting more out of my kick. Um, so it's a lot of just like fine tuning stuff. It's never like we're in the morning and I'm grinding like 300s breaststroke. Um, it's more of like, I'm doing hundreds at a time where I'm working on specific details and separating my stroke. I'm never really doing full breaststroke altogether. Uh, I rarely do that unless I'm pacing. Um, most of it's either um, I'm just like isolating my pull or isolating my kick and working on those. Destro Swim Towers. Gain strength in the water with a tower of power. Save $150 per double swim tower by using code BRETT, B-R-E-T-T, at checkout. DestroMachines.com. Vasa has been the go-to training tool outside of the pool for over 30 years. Vasa's products are ideal for developing power and proper technique in your swimmer's catch. Add a few Vasa trainers to your pool deck and it's like adding an extra lane to your swimming pool. Go to vasatrainer.com, use code BREAD at checkout and get 10% off anything from Vasa. Yeah, I saw Eddie is um, going to the World Championships. Were you surprised that he that he put his name in for that? Yeah, a little bit, but I'm I'm excited about it. I think it's really cool. I think it's awesome. I think I know everyone else is really excited to be coached by Eddie, and I think that's really cool that I get to be a part of. I don't know if it's his last trip. I don't. Maybe he'll go again next year if he gets invited. But um, I think it's potentially really cool that I get to have Eddie as a Team USA coach, and not only just like my Texas coach, um, and see how his interactions are there and how he impacts people there. Um, I was pumped about it. I knew, I knew either him or Wyatt were going to go. And um, it's, it's really cool to have your own coach on that type of trip. Yeah, that is awesome. And then Wyatt will be back holding the fort down, which would be good. Um, Mm -hmm. You, uh, how many more years have you got to Texas? You just did your, was it your freshman year you just did? I have two more. I just finished my sophomore year. Just finished your sophomore year. That's right. So Mm -hmm. you got two more. Are you feeling good about, the team, uh, I mean, how did you feel about the the team's race this year? And I, I got to tell you, you, maybe you heard it. I, I did publicly go out and call Cal to win. 
I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to admit it to you. I'm, <laughs> I just, look, there was a lot of it was the David Marsh factor and David's my coach. So it's like, I just felt like there was a lot of influence there in terms of what he could bring as a combination to what they already had. Uh, I, I did think um, you guys were, were very strong head to head on paper. Did it, did it upset you that I, that I said that publicly that Cal was going to win? Not at all. No, I know a lot of people were picking Cal. It's more of like bulletin board material for me. I was like, all right, let's go prove him wrong. Cause I, Good. I'm a fan of the podcast. So I listen to most of your, most of the stuff okay. that comes out. So I did, I did hear that. Okay. Um, but no, I think, I think overall about at NCAAs, I think I wouldn't do it with the mindset of, all right, we got this. Like I, there was zero part of me that thought we were going to lose. I like hundred percent thought ex- fully expected to win. Um, and I think part of that's good. I think part of that is me being confident in my guys and, and myself and expecting the highest out of us. And I think part of it is different than last year. I think last year, the whole year, we we're fueled by, all right, last time we had NCAAs, we lost. And even though I wasn't part of that team, I could see it in the other guys, um, how much that hurt them and how much they wanted to win. Um, and that was that that fired me up. That got me going. And I, I look, you look up at the banners and you're like, damn, we haven't won since... 2018 it was 2021 so like I was like all right we need to get another banner um and then we did that and then I think we were still fired up this year but it was a little different like we weren't coming off of a loss we were coming off of a win and now we're defending it so I wouldn't say I wouldn't say at all that we got complacent but I think the mindset shifted and I'm excited that it's going to go back to like all right let's go take it back uh next year yeah Um, look I when I was on the deck I saw nothing but good things man I saw a strong team I saw a talented bunch I just know that there was the, the same thing was going on over at Cal. I mean, you got two two top teams. I mean, it's it met, you know to me it was like the Super Bowl. The two best teams make it, and you guys were hit, hitting it out, smacking it out at the end. And you know, it's going to come to the Super Bowl comes down to one play kind of thing. You know, did did you feel like at any point maybe maybe on on Friday or Saturday was there was there one play that kind of went against you where you where you kind of lost momentum at all, or was it was it something different than that? Um, I think, and this totally isn't his fault. I think Cam, like false starting, and you can't do anything about a false start. A false start is literally just like something like your yeah. back spasms and it makes yeah. you twitch. I think, I think that obviously that hurts because Cam is our one of our best swimmers, if not our best swimmer last year. So, um, and I know he was real upset about it, and like that's a, that was the thing where I was like, all right, we literally can't control that. That's a yeah. false start. It's not like he jumped in early; he just yeah. flinched, and so. Um, I think that's kind of when the momentum started to shift a little bit, but I'm hard on myself. I mean, I, a lot of the meet, I was like, all right, like I got third in an event where I definitely could have won, which is the four I am. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see myself as one of our best swimmers. And in my eyes, like I can't be getting a sixth place and a third place in two of my best events. Like I need to be either winning it or at least getting second. Um, so I was hard on myself. I, obviously we didn't lose by like 15 points. So it's not like I, that would have changed it. But for me, it was like a momentum thing. Like if I could have won that, or if I could have gotten at least top two, I mean, Leon went the fastest time in history. So um, I think if I, I was hard on myself. I was really upset with myself the first two days, the first or second two days. Um, so I think that's kind of what in my head, why we weren't yeah. swimming as fast. Cause as a leader on the team, I wanted to be better and bring mm-hmm. everyone up. Um, but I think as a whole, we just got a bunch of ninth places and, um, which isn't, I, I'm, I'm not by any means saying Cal got lucky and winning. Cause that's totally on us. Like we, we have to be better in the morning. We have to make sure we're not getting ninth and getting eight instead. So, um, I think a lot of it is just like, we are just, we fell a little bit short in a lot of places. Yeah. What do you think about this kid, Leon Marchand, man? There's a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of heat on this kid right now. A lot of, a lot of talk about him and a lot of people that are impressed with him what's your thoughts on him and how he's swimming he's a beast i i remember i raced him at um 2019 world juniors back when he was like a little skinny kid like he he's <laughs> super tiny back then and he shows up to arizona state now he's filled out and mm. it's showing i mean he's splitting like what 18 mid on a 53 mm. um his underwaters are insane i don't think it's any secret that that's his strength is that mm-hmm. the, the longer he can go underwater the better he's gonna be mm-hmm. um and I mean, he's he swam one one season in the NCAA, and some people are already talking about how he could be the greatest short course swimmer ever by the, by his, the time he's done, um, yeah. which says a lot about him. But I'm excited. He he reached out to me after after trials last week, and uh, we're gonna get to race again. And 
he's just someone who like obviously you want to beat because he's a competitor but he's someone that like you enjoy racing just because he's a good kid is he is he kind of do you see this maybe as like the you know it's in paris right it's his home country so do you uh -huh. see it as kind of like you two the clash of the titans coming to this this point of, of maybe really duking it out at his home olympics together i just got i just got goosebumps thinking about that i didn't i haven't really even thought about that how it's in paris but um obviously i gotta make it first i gotta keep doing what i need to do to put myself in that position but um i think that'd be sweet obviously you got uh borodin of russia that's going to be also in there so um there's there's a lot the 4 am is getting really deep and really fast at the same time so um that would be that would be awesome if that was a showdown like it was uh like you just explained so uh hopefully i mean that's that's like the most exciting type of race i could think of is going it's kind of like a rocky movie a little bit um yeah yeah so so yeah it hopefully is. it will be man it's all it's always there's always some sort of movie script that goes into those top, top yeah. of events so it'll be pretty cool um you know you you had sent me a text a couple of weeks before trials here um you know just recently and, and you were pretty excited about some training stuff you'd done and especially in your 200 free. Um, so you it was this something that you were kind of like working towards this 200 free and getting on this relay team? Definitely. I think, I think there was always part of me that wanted to do the 200 free, obviously because there's more spots. Um, and I train a lot of freestyle. I get to race Drew a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I remember Drew is, Drew has like a, he's, he's a big fan of Ian Thorpe. And so I remember he talks a lot about him. So I, I went on your podcast and I was like searching for the Ian Thorpe uh podcast so i could listen to it and i came across the the part where it was like everyone's doing the 200 free wrong and mm -hmm. so i listened to it and i screen recorded it on my phone and i saved it and i watched it i swear i did it so we did a time trial a couple weeks after ncaa's and the 200 free was the first race i did and i watched it literally every single night before i went to bed for the lead up of that seven days mm -hmm. and then tried to execute it perfectly and i went a best time unshaved and in a time trial and practice and that's when i texted you i was like your <laughs> your podcast with with ian's making a difference for me it's it's helping me in that too free and then i i think it's no secret i tried to do it at uh world trials where i mean I, if you don't take it out fast you're not going to go fast yeah and yeah. the tuner free so um i think i think that's kind of i don't think it was any stroke change i think i've gotten better at freestyle just because i've gotten stronger but i think the a strategy change that i had mm. from this mm last year to this year a large uh, i mean entirely in part to listening to that podcast wow. um there you go mr ian thorpe having uh, an influence on the world of swimming still to this day i'm going to cut this and send it to him he'll be pretty happy, proud about that so that's that's awesome. cool man um well, that that is cool so it seems like there's room for growth in this 200 free then like you you're only just scratching the surface i'd imagine definitely and i i wasn't super happy with my finals time i think I, I felt incredible in prelims and I tried to back off and because everyone was telling me that I don't need to go all out in prelims and all that. So that's something I've kind of struggled with, but I tried to back off in prelims a little bit and looking back, I wish I would have just gone all out uh, mm -hmm. the last 25 because I went faster in the morning um, mm -hmm. and see what I can see what I can go. But I, I'm going to be on that relay, ho uh, hopefully in, at, in Budapest. And uh, I mean, maybe I get to be on the prelim relay and I get to lead off. Uh, so maybe I'll get a flat start time and I can go faster, but, um, I'm also good with just swinging and trying to, I mean, we're pretty big underdogs. I feel like in that relay. So I feel like that's, that's a pretty cool position for us to be in. We can just we chase the, the great Britain boys and, um, see if I can do my part. Yeah, man. The Brits are, the Brits are hungry. I mean, they continue to stay hungry. They're Olympic champs and I know they're working pretty hard right now. I, I'm in pretty close contact with uh, Jimmy Guy. He's a, he's a good good dude but he's working hard and they don't want to relinquish that so it's going to be a battle how do you uh how do you feel about this u.s team man it's it's a pretty young team isn't it it is it's super young and it's super cool because like it almost doesn't feel like a world's team to me because i've been on a team with so many of these guys that like world juniors so like i've been with with them at the junior level um like i was on an eight free relay in 2017 when i was 15 with trey freeman and drew kibler so two of two of the uh, six guys that are going, mm. or three of the six guys that are going, we're all in the same relay at, as, at a junior level. So wow. um, it's super young. Uh, I'm still like, like I look up to a lot of the guys. Like I look up to Murphy, I look up to Chase, I look up to Caleb. So it's like, it's gonna be cool to be able to learn from them and 
um, see how they handle themselves. And hopefully I get a few more of these down the road and um, then I can learn from what they're doing this time around and uh, use it when I'm eventually a veteran on the team. So um, it's a good combination of youth and, and veteran for sure. Well, I love it, man. Listen, this has been awesome. I love the redemption story that you went through. Um, I, I've suffered a similar pain missing the 96 Olympics, man, so I can empathize. I, I know exactly what that feels like. And then, um, and then, you know, coming back and doing what you've done and, and being number one in the world now, I mean, you're, you're an incredible young, young athlete. That's the thing is you're young, you, you know, even at 19, when you were sitting there feeling like you, you, your whole career was gone, it, it's, it hasn't. It's just started. There's so much Thank more you. ahead of you, man. I think everybody's so excited for your potential and who you, who, who you are now and what you'll become because, you know, you back it up with hard work, and I think that's the most important thing. And, and like I said, you're a good dude. I think a lot of people like you. A lot of people are wishing for success for you, so that's, that's awesome, man. Just um, you got a couple of sponsors. I want to at least give, you, give them a chance to kind of get on here. Who, who have you got backing you right now? So I got uh, Mizuno. Uh, it's mm -hmm. my my uh, suit sponsorship. Uh, they're the best. they I've worn their suits since I was 15. I haven't worn any other suits since then. So um, cool. It's a ideal partnership, and NIL has been really cool that I've been able to get this opportunity in college. And then uh, I also uh, work with Whoop. Um, mm -hmm. I have a partnership with them. Um, oh. They I have a battery on right now. But I mean, that's been probably the biggest change I've made this year in terms of swimming is my out of like out of the water habits in terms of getting to bed early and mm -hmm. doing all the things I need to like get my body recovered. And I think it's shown a little bit. So uh, Whoops had a big part in that. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to keep working with both of them. Well, that's cool, man. There's a lot, there's a, you know, they're great, but there's a lot more coming your way too. So I'm excited for your future, man. Uh, thanks for Thank doing you. this. And uh Good luck over the next few months, man. It's going to be an exciting time. Get back to work and um, get on that podium out of the out in Budapest, all right? Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you for having me on. See you, Carson. Take care, man. See ya. Event, heat, lane, name of swimmer, times and places. It's called Swim Nerd Live, and it allows the data and times from your actual scoreboard to be broadcast and viewed in real time on any smart TV, phone, or other device. There are so many things you can do with this software. A very simple and easy to use necessity for any team or facility that is live streaming their meets results. One click on any device and they're watching your swim meet live in real time. Go to swimpractice.com to learn more.